Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Bernard Dreyer. So Dr. Dreyer is a general and developmental behavioral pediatrician who has spent his professional lifetime serving poor children and families. Professor of Pediatrics at NYU, he leads the Division of Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics and is the Director of Pediatrics at Bellevue Hospital. He is a past president of the AEP and is a current serving as the AEP's Medical Director for Policies. Dr. Dreyer um, served as a member of the committee and authored the new National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine report, A Roadmap to Reducing Child Poverty. For over 40 years, he has led a primary care program at Bellevue including co, uh, including co located mental, men, mental and oral health services and clinics in homeless shelters. Good morning. He, his research is focused on interventions in primary care to improve early childhood outcomes, including early brain development and obesity. As AAP president, he led the AAP's strategic priority on poverty and child health. Dr. Dreyer it was president of the uh, Academic Pediatric Association and founded the APA's Task Force on Child Poverty and the APA Research Scholars Program. He is a recipient of many awards, including the NYU University-wide Distinguished Teaching Award, the AAP's prestigious Clifford C. Rulli Award, the AAP's Public Policy and Advocacy Award, and the AAP, uh, APA's Armstrong um, Leadership Award, and the New York Academy of Medicine Millie and Richard Brock uh, lectureship award. He has over 100 peer-reviewed research publications, and Dr. Dreyer also hosts the weekly radio show On Call for Pediatrics on Sirius XM. We are extremely honored to have him here today to do our presentation. Uh, hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'm going to just uh, start in. Uh, with the talk. So the, uh, the title, as you can see, is A Roadmap to Reducing Child Poverty. Uh, that was the uh, name of the report out of the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, previously the IOM. And uh, I'm going to, however, start uh, with uh, my disclosure. I have nothing, uh, no financial disclosures. Uh, these are the objectives. Uh, you can see what they are. I'm not going to read them. Uh, and I'm going to start by with some basic facts about child poverty in the United States. Uh, as you can see, uh, children, uh, uh, th this shows the official poverty level, by the way, from 1959 to 2018. Uh, as you can see, since 1995, uh, children in blue have been the, the poorest age group in the United States. Uh, as, as it says at the top, this, this measure is based on uh, what people ate in 1963. In other words, their food diet, which was considered their USDA thrifty food budget minimal level of food multiplied by three. However, now, instead of 33% of our uh, budget on food, it's about 15%. So in fact, uh, using this figure, it underestimates poverty by about, uh, you know, half, a half of what it really is. Uh, Across the range of child poverty or a poverty levels, this is from the 2000, the September 2020 uh, census report. You can see that children at any level, including deep poverty below 50% uh, or below 200% poverty, children are the poorest group, poorest age group in our society. Of course, there are. Um, significant uh, disparities in poverty rates. Uh, in black and Afri or African-American children are the poorest at 32%. American Indian children are about, about as poor at 31%. Latinx children 
at 26% and white children at 11%. But this is not the whole story because uh, family net worth in addition to income poverty is dramatically different by race, ethnicity. And here you can see that white uh, families have um, a median uh, family net worth of about 10 times that of the average black or African-American uh, family and about the same for Hispanic or Latinx families. And this is not corrected by social class. So equalizing social class, as you can see, for example, here, whites um, uh, at, with at least some college, you know, have um, seven times the wealth of an African-American family with at least some college and about four times the wealth of um, a Latinx family. And even whites with less, high less than a high school education have more wealth than an African-American family with, um, with some college. Likewise, a family structure uh, is very unequal. And here you can see that a two-parent two household uh, with children, uh, a white family has about 10 times the, the wealth of a black or Latinx family. And actually a white single parent has about twice the wealth of a black a two parent family. Part of the legacy of uh, redlining is, is what has led to this uh, significant uh, uh, wealth disparity or asset disparity. This is a, uh, so the, the homeowners loan corporation, which was set up in the new deal, uh, set up a system of redlining black neighborhoods as risky for mortgages and created a legacy that exists to this day. This map that I'm showing you is from 1937. It's of Pittsburgh. Uh, and you can see the red areas which were redlined and were primarily African-American families. Uh, it, they used the one house rule. One, uh, one house, one African-American owned house made that entire uh, um, area risky for providing mortgages. This is uh, sort of akin to the one drop rule in Jim Crow that one drop of Black blood made somebody uh, black, uh, and that which uh, started in the late 19th century. As you can see, um, the red stands for hazardous. And if you compare um, that map to where African Americans uh, in Pittsburgh live today, you can see the, in the hatched areas that African-Americans, um, persistent black communities exist in those same redlined or at best yellow, which meant declining, definitely declining neighborhoods across Pittsburgh. Again, this is not specific for Pittsburgh. This is uh, a, something that occurs across the country. I just thought using the example of Pittsburgh would be uh, helpful for, this, for these grant rounds. There's something called the basic needs budget. And so this map shows the minimum amount necessary to meet basic needs for a family of four without relying on outside help. Uh, it includes factors such as housing, food, childcare, health insurance, et cetera. Not, not going to the movies, but, uh, um, but just uh, uh, essential, uh, 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 income. And uh, you can see that uh, at a minimum in, I think that's uh, Mississippi, about $50,000 is required. And up in New York and California, it's about 80,000. So again, uh, the level at which par families of four uh, don't need assistance is not $25,000, which is the uh, present 
federal poverty level, but probably twice or even three times as much. And poverty is everywhere. This is from a um, study, a uh, periodic survey of pediatricians that the AAP does. You can see in, on the average, for, uh, almost 50% of their families were poor or low income. This is across the board. And even in the suburbs, about almost 30% of the families they took care of were poor or low income. In 2013, AAP adopted a child poverty as a, a strategic agenda for children, and it remains there today. Uh, uh, you can see it's in white at, at the moment, and that is because it's integrated uh, into uh, all the activities. And in, in 2016, uh, we issued, a po when I was president of the AAP, we issued a poverty uh, and child health policy statement, which uh, encouraged pediatricians to screen for social determinants of health and connect families to community resources, but importantly, for government to cut child poverty rates and ameliorate the impact on children, especially in early childhood. It is now being revised, and uh, I have been actively involved in its revision. I will briefly discuss neurodevelopmental, uh, neurodevelopment and toxic stress as part of the picture of poverty. So um, neurodevelopment, as you can see in this uh, schematic, results from ongoing and cumulative interactions between experience, biology, and behavior. This leads to a vicious or virtuous cycle where harsh experiences worsen behavior and worse behavior negatively feeds back to the child's experience. Or in contrast, positive supportive experiences lead to a, adaptive coping skills which positively feed back to the child's environment. As can be seen on the, uh, these, uh, this diagram, these are mediated through the direct effect of experience on behavior on brain development or the effect of experience indirectly on brain development through epigenetic change. Brains are built over time. It's important to remember that uh, first come the sensory pathways, language is next and cognitive functions starting early but extending into adolescence and young adulthood. And this is, um, these drawings are of the newborn brain and the two-year-old's brain. Make the point of why early experience really matters. The brain triples in weight during that time and frankly, doesn't grow that much more after that. Uh, and uh, I usually joke, uh, especially when uh, uh, our previous president was the president that that may explain why some of our national leaders act like toddlers. Uh, I'm feeling uh, differently now. This uh, also, it looks at the neuronal architecture, neuronal architecture from birth to two years as shown here. And there are 1700 new synapses created each second in the early years. If you spend time with the younger child, young child, you can actually see those connections being made. There are uh, a thousand trillion or a, a quadrillion connections made by three years of age. And of course, this is not only about synapses, but about pruning those connections that are not used and strengthening, strengthening those that are used. Which uh, fighting against this sort of positive brain development and child development is toxic stress. Uh, toxic stress is a strong, frequent, or prolonged active activation of the body's stress response systems in the absence of buffering protection of a supportive adult relationship. Um, and this uh, shows the impact 
of uh, uh, epigenetic changes through methylation and demethylation and acetylation or deacetylation. Here in the unmethylated state, um, transcription um, uh, and therefore protein production can occur. But in the methylated state, uh, transcription is blocked. And finally, you can see the, the combined effects are shown leading to an uncoiled open system available for transcription on the left versus a coiled methylated gene with arrested transcription that is effectively silent. Uh, Moshe Ziff has performed experiments with rats, rats looking at epigenetic changes. As this picture shows, rats can be very cute. Um, and adorable. And this, in this case, rat mothers were selected who licked or didn't lick their pups. Those who licked produced calmer, more social pups, and these were associated with epigenetic changes related to methylation, non-methylation of glucocorticoid receptors in their brains. Those that didn't lick and groom their pups produced asocial pups who also had difficulty performing on a treadmill. And these mothers were foster mothers. So no genetic, direct genetic relationships were involved. Here's a detail of Ziff's work. High licking grooming uh, affects epigenetic regulation of glucocorticoid receptors which leads to a cascade ultimately producing activation of nerve growth factor inducible A, a leading to expression of the NR3C1 gene by demethylation. This leads to increased expression of glucocorticoid receptors and enhanced negative feedback sensitivity to glucocorticoids. And this, there's evidence that this is carried into future um, generations. The opposite is true for those who are forced by low licking and grooming mothers. Toxic stress may lead to permanent changes in brain fu function and structure. There are abundant uh, glucocorticoid receptors found in the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. The prefrontal cortex, of course, is the center of executive at functions, the amygdala triggers emotional responses and the hippocampus is the center of short-term memory. Um, in addition to epigenetic changes like those seen in the rat experiments, toxic stress is associated with hypertrophy of the amygdala, but with loss of neurons and synapses in the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. This leads to more anxiety, exaggerated stress response due to hyperactivation of the amygdala and less top-down control of the prefrontal cortex, as well as impaired memory and mood control due to hippocampal reduction. In addition to anxiety and emotional dysregulation, reduced executive functioning and impaired memory have negative impact on early child learn childhood learning and school performance. <coughs> child poverty is of course associated with ACEs or adverse childhood events or experiences which, which in turn cause toxic stress with environmental risks, with food insecurity and with homelessness. And this uh, uh, looks at, uh, this is, uh, shows the nine child ACEs measured by the National Survey of Children's Health starting in 2011. Uh, they include poverty, divorce, or death of a parent, incarceration of a parent, with witnessing domestic violence, uh, neighborhood violence, living with someone who is mentally ill or an alcohol who has an alcohol or drug problem or, or experiencing racism. And of course, experiencing ACEs, as I said, leads to toxic stress. 
This looks at the relationship of ACEs to poverty, the four children aged zero to 17, experiencing two or more ACEs, you can see that um, about 35% of, of those uh, children uh, less than living in less than the federal poverty level uh, have two or more ACEs, whereas if you get to 400% or more of poverty, it's uh, less than 10%. This is really, there is really, as you can see, a linear relationship between poverty uh, and, um, and the number of ACEs that children experience. This actually get, looks at more detail. I'm not gonna dwell on this, but basically this looks at zero, one, two, three, or four or more ACEs. You can see the same pattern but even with more detail at each level of ACEs, uh, there's a linear uh, uh, relationship with poverty level. But of course, this slide shows the details of the scandalous Flint water crisis, including a map of the hotspots of high residual tap water lead levels in Flint, samples of the water from Flint in Detroit and the schematic um, of how the crisis occurred due to mismanagement of the water supply. The simple fact is that poor children around the country are exposed to lead, a potent neurotoxin in both old housing uh, with lead and paint and dust, as well as lead in the water and pipes. In addition, the fact that they have increased iron deficiency leads to increased absorption of lead. Poor children are also exposed to um, a variety of other air pollutants and other environmental risks. This looks at uh, uh, food security. And um, poor children have much higher rates of food security than non-poor children. As you can see, uh, those that are poor have almost a 50% chance of being food insecure those uh, between 100 and 199 percent of poverty are, are 32 percent food insecure and that drops dramatically to less than eight percent when you get above 200 percent of the poverty level the same is true for very low food security as well as just being food insecure um, and this study that I'm quoting here found that uh, higher food insecurity and poverty is associated with academic and psychosocial problems, even when controlling for poverty level and other confounding factors. And of course, uh, as we know during COVID, which I'll discuss in a moment, food insecurity has dramatically increased. Uh, family homelessness, uh, it is estimated that about two and a half million children in the U.S. are homeless for at least part of the year. And this is old news in 2013. It's probably significantly higher now. This is almost exclusively, exclusively a problem of poverty because of lack of affordable housing, often inter intersecting with ACEs, such as domestic violence. Being homeless is also frequently preceded by significant periods of housing instability and li living in a substandard housing. You know, I have a special um, concern about family homelessness. Actually, I be, be, uh, my beginning involvement in the AAP in the 1980s and as an advocate for children uh, related to the epidemic of family homelessness that existed in the, that started in New York in the mid 1980s. And actually there are twice as many homeless families and children now than there were when I was horrified by the number. As Parker Greer and Zuckerman noted uh, almost three decades, decades ago that children growing up in poverty suffer from double jeopardy. They are more likely to have insults to their health and well-being, 
they are, uh, but uh, are less likely to be cushioned by a protective environment. But in fact, double jeopardy doesn't describe it well enough. It, it is actually a pile on of multiple jeopardies. <clears throat> as you can see here, poverty is associated, as I've shown you, with ACEs and toxic stress, with food insecurity and iron deficiency, with lead and other toxin. It's also uh, associated with increased low birth weight impacting neurodevelopment, increased chronic diseases such as asthma, increased accidental injury leading uh, to significant increased death rates in poor children, poor access to healthy foods and to safe and healthy play environments uh, that allow for exercise and for liberating fun. And of course, homelessness and substandard housing and uh, all uh, connected to uh, government neglect uh, and incompetence as was seen in Flint, Michigan. The COVID pandemic has um, further um, peeled back the onion on the, the interconnections between poverty, racism, anti-immigrant uh, animus, and of course the pandemic itself. There are higher death rates and infection rates in families um, who are poor, especially if they are African-American or Latinx. These children have lack of high-speed internet access and therefore significant problems with virtual education, uh, making worse their academic performance. Uh, because their wealth is close, close to zero, they have no cushion once, the, once the, uh, the parents lose their jobs and they go from scraping by to having no cash whatsoever, leading to hunger, eviction, and other major problems. And of course, the anti-immigrant animus that has occurred uh, through the last four years and hopefully is now gonna recede has led to uh, immigrants being prevented from seeking asylum or using the pandemic as an excuse to deport all of those crossing the border. Just wanna uh, give a shout out to the residents at Bellevue, and I'm sure this is true in many programs, but our residents noted that our patients were literally calling in on virtual visits or coming in on, on in-person visits saying, I have absolutely no money. I have absolutely no food in the house. So they raised, uh, the residents raised about $25,000 uh, through, uh, and, and uh, Children of Bellevue, which is our auxiliary, raised another 18,000. And we have been distributing $100 gift certificates to many of our patients. Uh, at this, when I made this slide, uh, half the money raised was distributed, but that was in November. By now, all the money has been distributed. Uh, the, um, the residents, as you can see here, also got donations of food, formula, rice, and other dry goods and diapers. So, what is the impact of poverty on neurodevelopment and academic uh, success? These are just two of the research studies that a number of researchers uh, have docu uh, documented uh, uh, using functional MRI to look at brain structure and development, volumes and surface area in children growing up in poverty compared to those at higher income. And I, I just show these as two examples of studies. As an example, uh, this study by Kim Noble shows differences in the surface area of the brain in children growing up in poverty. Rep red represents the largest areas of differences and includes the temporal and frontal lobes and prefrontal cortex. Of course, poverty's association with these brain uh, changes is not just due to toxic stress, but due to the lack of resources 
for learning based on material hardship, increased parental stress, leading to generally less effective parenting. This uh, looks at uh, a study um, which looked at volumetric differences in gray matter associated with growing up in poverty. And you can see high SES is in green, low SES is in blue, and you can see these differences grow from five months to three years of age. As shown in this landmark study by Hart and Risley, illustrated in this graph, disparities in children's verbal abilities, in this case, uh, measured by their cumulative vocabulary, uh, actually begin with a, a very early in childhood. Uh, these disparities are pre present at the time children start to produce speech and widen over time. And this has led to a, uh, a common um, way of thinking about this as the 30 million word gap, which is illustrated here. This is the estimated cu cumulative, cumulative words addressed to the child as the child goes from birth to 48 months. And the, and the gap between uh, high educated and uh, high income families uh, to those living in poverty is about 30 million. But it's not only the number of words that are different, but rather it's the, uh, uh, the richness of the language that they hear. Positive support for language uh, and, uh, and, and uh, really expanding the child's language rather than a lot of negative or uh, commands. This looks at uh, this graph from the journal Science looks at math achievement from um, school entry to 12 years of age and compares the, lo the lowest income quartile to the highest income quartile. And you can see that the majority of the gap is there already at school entry. And by third grade, it's pretty much. Um, uh, completely uh, baked into the system. The same is true. This looks at uh, reading uh, from school entry to 14 years of age in poor versus high SES uh, families. Uh, and you can again see that at school entry, there's a wide disparity. Uh, by fourth grade, half of the poor children have difficulties reading and never catch up. Uh, Duncan and Murnane looked at the gaps between high income and low income students in kindergarten, shown in light gray and fifth grade shown in dark gray. Uh, above the line, richer students outscore poorer students. Below the line, it is the reverse. As you can see, the gaps persist or increase for reading achievement, school engagement, as well as antisocial behavior and mental health problems. Many studies document that these problems travel with poor children into their adult lives. And this study by Duncan is a striking example. It's a national sample of US children look at how poverty experienced in the first six years of life related to adult outcomes. As you can see, children growing up in poverty um, end up uh, uh, making about half the earnings as adults, uh, more likely to be on food stamps, almost three times as likely to be in poor health and um, almost three times as uh, for, for, the, for the women were more than five times as likely to have non-marital growth. So the, the impact of early childhood poverty is lifelong and therefore intergenerational. Which brings me to the um, roadmap to reducing child poverty that uh, uh, was published by the National Academies of now it's going to be two years, uh, February 2019.
It was uh, uh, created by an interdisciplinary committee with broad perspectives in public policy, economics, social science, child welfare, medicine, and developmental psychology. I was, uh, as I used to say, the token doctor. Uh, I was, uh, a, a, as well as the token pediatrician in this group. Uh, this was a very exciting experience for me because I got to work with really the best minds in social science, policy, economics, um, et cetera. And uh, it was a privilege to be part of this. This is the list. I'm not gonna read off the names, but it's a pretty impressive list. Greg Duncan was the chair. And we were, uh, this was funded by Congress initially. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, they asked us to review the research on linkages uh, between child poverty and child well-being. Uh, provide objective analyses of the poverty reducing effects of major assistance programs directed at children and families and provide policy and program recommendations for reducing the number of children living in poverty in, by half within 10 years. So let me just give a disclaimer because this was our um, uh, charge, we really couldn't uh, uh, study those um, uh, programs that affect early brain development because those lead to uh, changes in the next generation as these kids grow up and therefore are not within 10 years. And so this is really looking at income poverty and doing something about it right now. This is not to say that uh, supporting early brain development, as I've already demonstrated here, is not critical. But it was not the charge of this particular report. Um, we looked at correlations, uh, and, and there are many, many studies that look at that show consistent correlations between poverty and a host of adverse childhood experiences and outcomes. But we wanted to focus on causal studies because you know correlations could be due to uh, uh, other factors, but a causal study shows that poverty itself impacts the child or reducing poverty improves their outcome. Uh, we looked at uh, two pathways that uh, were hypothesized uh, uh, from uh, child poverty to child outcomes. One is the investment pathway. If parents have less money, if they have material hardship, then they can't provide either the resources or the experiences that child children need. And likewise, the stress pathway, pathway which uh, showed, uh, which uh, looks at parental stress. And if the parents are under extreme stress, if they can't get food on the table every night. As I usually say, it's hard to read your child good night moon. So uh, stress pathways makes uh, parents less effective at uh, nurturing and or uh, speaking and or educating their children. We looked at a number of uh, natural experiments. Most of the causal studies were not true experiments except for the welfare to work programs. Uh, I'm, I don't have time to go through all of these now since I know that uh, time is flying away here, but uh, I'll just, I'm gonna briefly talk a little about the earned income tax credit. And this, uh, we, we looked at studies of child outcomes from policy induced increases in the earned income tax credit over time and what they did to children's outcomes. The welfare to work programs uh, were interesting. They were true experiments that the states did prior to uh, removing, uh, you know, mandating work programs, but in fact showed that parents working did not improve child outcomes. It is only if in, in addition to their working, you maintained their financial support so that they made money and they maintained their financial support and that 
increased their income, which led to better outcomes. Social security increases, uh, SSI increases on either side of a birth weight cutoff show that the lower birth weight kids, in fact, did better because they received SSI, even though they should have done worse based on birth weight. Uh, tribal government supplemental income, these are natural experiments. The most famous is in North Carolina where there was a, um, uh, a casino that opened on a uh, uh, reservation uh, in the middle of an ongoing uh, epidemiological study of all children, both on and off the reservation, to see what their outcomes are, uh, were. And uh, on average, most of the um, tribal families received about $4,000 a year per child based on casino income. And um, this improved uh, child and adolescent outcomes very significantly. And then of course, again, for food stamps, there were uh, rollout increases over time, which could be looked at and uh, to see the impact on child outcomes. All of these studies showed that increasing child uh, parent income uh, made a difference, in, a positive difference in child's emotional and academic outcomes. Um, which is what I'm saying here, the weight of causal evidence indicates that poverty itself causes negative child outcomes, especially when poverty occurs in early childhood or persists throughout a large portion of childhood and many programs that alleviate poverty, either directly by providing income transfer such as earned income tax credit, or indirectly by providing food, housing, or medical care, such as SNAP or medical insurance, have been shown to improve child well-being. Uh, as an example, uh, I'm just going to show you briefly the natural experiments with increases in earned income tax credit. Um, this is from Chetty Friedman and Rockoff in 2011. And you can see that as the tax credit increased, there was a linear, linear reaction with average test scores of math and reading for those kids. And the test scores were in turn associated with increased college attendance at age 20. And likewise with projected earnings from college at age 20. So th th this was uh, powerful evidence, not only of the worth of the earning of tax credit, but really of providing money to poor families. We looked at the impact on child poverty. This was done through modeling, through the TRIM database that the Urban Institute uh, maintains. Uh, and you can see that earned income tax credit, child tax credit, uh, reduced child poverty by almost 6%, SNAP by 5%, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, without all programs, uh, child poverty would be about 9% higher than it is now. So it isn't true that federal, uh, federal programs don't work. It's not that the war on poverty failed but rather that it didn't go far enough because all of these, all of these programs really are related to the war in poverty. We then uh, did a, um, uh, we, this is a summary of simulated programs and policies. We simulated a variety of of programs related to work, such as earned income tax credit, expanding childcare subsidies, increasing the federal minimum wage. We looked at also increasing existing safety net programs like SNAP, SSI, and we looked at policies in other countries, such as replacing the tax child tax credit with a universal child allowance, and I will get back to that later. Uh, or, uh, uh, and, and uh, we had two versions of each program, a martyr and a stronger version. And as you can see, no one program met the goal of reducing child poverty in half. The one that came close 
closer was the more generous child allowance, which is a modification of the child tax credit, which you can see um, reduced, uh, almost reduced poverty in, in half. We then put together four policy and program packages. We did a work-oriented program because there is a feeling, uh, especially among conservatives, that we want to require work and we want to help parents by encouraging work. And as you can see uh, in this package, um, uh, we reduced child poverty by almost 20% for a very modest cost of uh, almost 9 billion but 20% uh, was well below the 50% we were uh, asked to define. We, we then looked at a promising middle-level uh, middle program that combined some uh, work-based uh, and universal support programs. And this um, uh, reduced child poverty by almost 40%. Uh, and, uh, cost about $45 uh, billion. And then uh, we looked at two programs uh, that um, cost a lot more, but reduced, it got beyond the 50%. One was just expanding existing means test support programs with some work programs. The other combined work programs with some new ideas like the child allowance, also eliminating 1996 immigration eligibility uh, criteria. These, however, uh, although they, they also reduced deep poverty, um, they cost uh, between 90 and $109 billion. Just a few words about that $100 billion price tag. It's estimated that uh, child poverty costs our uh, our country about a uh, trillion dollars uh, a year in lost revenue or increased expenses. So a hundred billion is actually a small amount of money. We're now used to trillions of dollars of support being given. So when I first gave these uh, this um, talk, uh, people were like gasping at a hundred billion. Now a hundred billion is, uh, you know, pocket change. Where to next? So I think uh, that uh, Canada has moved to a child benefit or a child allowance, uh, looking at uh, about five thousand, four to 5,000 per year per child, age six to 17. And you can see uh, the, uh, their new uh, amount of money. And it, it, uh, it, uh, it levels out at after about $150,000 per year for the families. In, in 2019, uh, uh, Brown, Bennett, Delorio, and others uh, reduced a, the uh, American Family Act of 2019. And this was included in the Democrats' Hero Act this past spring which would take the child tax credit and modify it so that it went, uh, it, its major problem is it doesn't help the poorest kids. It would be given to people irrespective of their income, meaning they didn't have to make the income to get the credit. So it was really, it's really a child allowance, not a tax credit. It was, it would be increased to about three to three and a half thousand dollars a year. Um, and um, uh, it would be given uh, every month to the parents so they could use it more effectively in their budget. And Joe Biden, as the latest pandemic plan, basically mimicked this uh, proposal um, as well. And of course, here he is uh, at his desk but his economic relief package as uh, it was uh, announced two, two, three days ago uh, would basically cut child poverty in half by this child tax credit uh, moving into a child allowance. So 
In fact, uh, two years ago, we recommended the child allowance as a major way of uh, reducing child poverty. At, at that point, when I mentioned this to people, they said, this is never gonna happen. Uh, but I think um, we have a good chance that it may very well happen now. It's only gonna be temporary due to the pandemic, but I, my bet is if it could get passed, it's gonna be hard to with, hard uh, really to withdraw it afterwards. Um, now, all of this doesn't get us to reducing intergenerational child poverty by focusing on early childhood brain development. So the um, National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine is trying to raise money to in fact do that study. Uh, I think the pandemic has uh, sort of stopped them in their tracks, but, um, but I, I, I suspect that once things quiet down, they're gonna be raising the money to start to focus on early on funding of early childhood programs um, that will help children. Finally, just a few words about Pittsburgh. Uh, we have done, we at Bellevue, uh, Alan Mendelson and I and others have developed an intervention called the Video Interaction Project. And it is now being studied in Pittsburgh with uh, Danny Shaw from the University of Pittsburgh um, in, com in combination with um, Family Checkup, which is a home visiting program for those at high risk. I'm not gonna go through this whole slide, but uh, to point out that in addition to theirs, and that's called Smart Beginnings, uh, so everybody gets a video interaction project in primary care. Those that are higher risk get a home visiting program uh, designed by Danny Shaw and his uh, colleagues called Family Checkup, etc. cetera. Um, and you can see, uh, however, the, there's also a, a citywide implementation that's underway. Uh, which I think, uh, you know, I'm really impressed with the city of Pittsburgh in trying to do this. Um, and this is looking at a birth co cohort of about 5,000 and a toddler cohort of about 3,000 over several years and, and really uh, offers different um, interventions based on the strength of the family. So as you can see here, families that have high strength and low challenges um, get you know a low low touch interventions. Those with moderate strengths and moderate uh, challenges get um, uh, maybe video interaction itself and some other uh, warm handoffs. Uh, those with limited strengths get really the smart beginnings combo, and those with uh, limited strengths and very high challenges get all of that plus a warm, a warm handoff to early intervention. So uh, just uh, Pittsburghians, uh, you should be proud that your city is uh, trying this citywide implementation um, uh, to help uh, do something about child poverty. If you want to learn more, um, this is where the full report is. Uh, it's at nap.edu. If you just put in a roadmap to reducing child poverty, National Academy, you'll get here. And you can download this entire report for free. There's also a data explorer to, uh, tool. There are report highlights, appendices. P please uh, look at the appendices because a, lo a lot of the evidence is put into the appendix. And I'm gonna end with my usual comment, which is um, it's easier to be, build strong children, tend to repair broken men. That's what Frederick Douglass said. Uh, I've changed that to people um, because obviously we want to repair more than the men. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any comments or questions, uh, et cetera.
Thank you so much, Dr. Dreyer. That was wonderful. Um, we have uh, some great questions already. Um, Good. So um, from one of our um, current chiefs, um, says, thank you so much for this inspiring presentation. Um, from a policy standpoint, there are both federal, state, and local initiatives, as you have also outlined. Pediatricians have been an active on all levels, but where do you feel our best efforts may be for successful outcomes in this political <coughs> So I think, um, number one, I think uh, that uh, depends. So for example, I would say until January 20th of this year, I said, you know, the federal government's not gonna do anything at the moment, focus on your state and national, uh, state and local level. And, and pediatricians have done that. And we in New York state, as an example, are, are also doing a citywide, um, a program through uh, through our healthcare system called Impact One Two Three, where we're combining various interventions in primary care to improve child outcomes, early, especially in early childhood. We are meeting with Medicaid to see if we can get Medicaid to pay for some of the primary care interventions. Um, so, and of course, regarding Police brutality, that's a local issue, really. It's not, I mean, there are national components, but really, if I want to do something about police uh, in New York City, I, I can, as a pediatrician, be working with others to do something about that. Likewise, education and early childhood education is really all state or local. So there's a lot to be done there. Uh, however, now, I think there is an opportunity for us to be advocating with our senators and with our uh, uh, representatives to push this uh, child tax credit reform and expansion, even if it's temporary, uh, because this would this would really do an amazing about face on childhood poverty. And we've been talking about it for a while. At first, people couldn't believe we could do it. I think now we may be able to do it. So this is the time for federal advocacy. Wonderful, thank you. That's very inspiring. <laughs> um, next question we have, um, is any government or academic entity going to be capturing the impact of the recently signed Biden-Harris tax credit? Uh, I mean, there's a natural, the census, um, so number one, uh, the census will capture its impact on child poverty levels. But you're asking, I, I, think, I think the question goes beyond that, which is, uh, is there uh, funding to study the impact of that? And the answer is uh, twofold. Number one, there is already a study that Greg Duncan is leading that looks at doing exactly that with a sub with a, with a um, you know randomized control within a randomized control study that's giving um, families that level of support and seeing what it's doing to child outcomes. I think also just like there were earned income tax credit studies looking at the impact of those policy changes. They'll, I'm sure there are researchers, and I know many of them, that will jump on this as a, a way of looking for changes in outcomes. And, and that kind of change it usually looks at um, local databases uh, of specific populations, and is uh, I'm sure I'm sure if this actually gets done, uh, we will definitely be able to look at it. Right now, by the way, it's complicated by the pandemic because so many poor children have been uh, really had their academic activities really curtailed and damaged by the pandemic. But nevertheless, I think we should look at that too, by the way. And I think we, we need to look at that as well. Great, thank you. Um, and I have one last question, um, just sort of, I know you had talked about sort of the great uh, policies that have been enacted by the administration. Um, 
for the current COVID package. And I was wondering if there's any sort of one policy that you thought would be most impactful to continue um, going forward to have the best impact on poverty long term. Well, I mean, uh, number one, I'm totally supportive of raising the minimum wage to $15. Uh, just to, to be honest about that, uh, raising the minimum wage doesn't really impact child poverty that much, but I think in general, it, it just makes work uh, more worthwhile. And I think over time will be a really important thing to continue. And I think that's not gonna be withdrawn. Um, I think, um, uh, well, you know, for me, I think of course the child tax credit reform would be amazing. Uh, but also there are reforms in healthcare. Um, you know, we've also uh, learned about un unrelated to the uh, pandemic package, there are amazing uh, responses to climate change, which has the potential to save our planet or attempt to save our planet. So I think there are, there's a lot to want to see continued. Um, 